My name is Kabir, and I love jazz music. I loved it the first time my sister brought home a Miles Davis album, and I hit play. I think I was in fifth grade, and I couldn't believe that Miles Davis and his colleagues, John Coltrane, uh, Winston Kelly, they were actually making up this music as they went along. They're improvising. And I thought, this is way different than the music of the canon, Western art music. You know, Franz Joseph Haydn, his surprise symphony, is no longer a surprise to me because I know how it's going to end every single time. So I devoted my life partly to studying this music, writing about this music, starting a nonprofit group about this, a nonprofit group devoted to helping musicians. And about eight years ago, 2004, I had the great honor of t going on tour with a Grammy award-winning musician who I had performed with. And the same summer I was in college, I was a speechwriter and a special assistant on the John Kerry presidential campaign. So I was going from one tour, a presidential campaign, to another, which was a musical tour. And I said, you know what, there's some commonality here. There's some commonality here. And that commonality, I kind of coined the term then, and I'm speaking about it today, is jazz music is democracy and sound. Jazz music is democracy and sound. Now you can say to me, Kabir, that's um, great, but you can compare any one thing to the other. What well, makes this comparison very special? And I contend to you that we think in metaphors. We think in metaphors. We just heard Philip Roebuck uh, sing. Some of his lyrics are very metaphorical. He was comparing one thing to the other. When Robert Frost says, two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by. The metaphor at work there is, we see life as a journey. And the idea worth spreading today, if you take one thing, from, one thing away from my remarks, is that see what's happening in DC, see what's happening in the state capitol in Atlanta, not as partisan bickering, but as conflict and release, call and response, uh, discord and harmony, melody and cacophony. Ralph Ellison said, we can either live with noise, live with music, or die with noise. And I want you to start to conceive of our government not as we're at odds, but we're working together. Now, the way I start this metaphor, I'm going to structure my remarks in two ways. First, I'm going to compare jazz and democracy, and then I'm going to look at jazz music abroad. Because if you look at jazz music abroad, it's like having a relationship with someone. You learn a lot about yourself when you, when you have a relationship with someone. You learn if you're selfish, you learn if you're kind, you learn if you hog the toothpaste. You learn all about yourself when you're in a relationship. And I think if you look at jazz music in the audience it had abroad, we'll start to learn a lot about this music, and it can serve as a compass for where we need to go as a country. So jazz and democracy, the question I want to ask is not what's democratic about jazz music, it's what's American about America? Let's make a list together. What are the things that typify America? Baseball, apple pie, you can go down the street here, Coca-Cola, right? I would say jazz music, the Constitution. Why am I making this list? Because these things share property, share properties. And the properties they share are what I would say is the main comparison between jazz music and, democrat and democracy. So I'm going to compare the Constitution and jazz music. We've all taken our social, story, social studies classes, we've all taken history classes, and before the Constitution, we had the Articles of Confederation. There was a problem with the Articles of Confederation. Daniel Shays, Daniel Shays led the rebellion in 1786. He said, I have a problem with the taxes. So what did he do? He created a rebellion. He went, without, he went outside of the system to topple the government. And it wasn't until James Madison came about and said, you know, you know what, instead of flummoxing human nature, we need to create a system that if you've got a problem with society, you use government to get rid of the problems. If you have the blues, you play the blues to get rid of the blues. You use a system, no matter what you think about the Occupy Wall Street movement, no matter what you think about the Tea Party movement, they're not a Shays Rebellion. They're saying, we're going to try to get, ourself, get ourselves elected, we're going to try to move the country in a certain direction. And they're coming, and they're coming within the system. That's the first thing I want you to, to take away from these remarks, is that you play the blues to get rid of the blues. Use democracy to rid yourselves of the problem of democracy. All right? The Constitution. What is the Constitution? It's basically a four-page document, but we've governed 200 years on it. Tom Paine, the great American patriot, he said, 
The Constitution is antecedent to government. You need something written down before you can govern. A jazz piece, just one page of music, I can play 20 minutes on the same piece. You ever listen to a Miles Davis recording? They're not reading music. They're making it up as they go. So you have this grid of what's written down. You look at the Constitution, all these laws. This is what's written down. We must abide by this. When I, put, when I get up on a jazz stand, I play the bass. The first thing I say is, what's the time signature? Okay, 4-4, four, four, great. What's the meter? What's the, what's the, what what, what uh, key is this in? And the next time you listen to a jazz piece, listen to the drums and listen to the bass. The drums and the bass. The bass is going to sound something like... And the drums are going to play with it. That is immovable. That is the grid. We have to respect the rhythm. We have to respect the beat. And at the same time, we have something called improvisation. Improvisation, what does that mean? The Constitution is the fallible document. It's a living document. If you have a problem with the Constitution, go out, convince your compatriots to go change the Constitution. We've done it 25, 26 times. Jazz music, we can amend, we can create. It's the triumph of the verb, doing, over the noun. Every time I go see Hamlet, to be or not to be, we all know Hamlet's going to choose not to be. Every time you go to a jazz performance, you don't know what he's going to choose. You don't know what he's going to say. So I would contend to you that jazz music and democracy have this have this very principle of having the, the centrality of the rhythm, the drums and the bass, with the extemporaneous nature of the soloist. You've got a problem, this is what, what I want to say, we, we have, a, we have a, uh, a very powerful spirit at work. And the last part about this comparison is the spirit. We're all here at TEDx today. And if Alexis de Tocqueville, the great French, American, the French writer, were here today, he would probably be sitting in this room. He said, America has a great spirit about it. They like to associate. He went to a Vermont town hall. This was back in the 1700s. They like to talk. They like to negotiate. They like to talk about ideas worth spreading. They like to come to TEDx events, <laughs> right? This doesn't always happen in other countries. This doesn't always happen in other countries where people just get up and start talking about ideas. And he said, this is fundamental to American culture, participation. The front row is very close. It reminds me of a jazz performance that when I'm playing my trombone, the spit can come out and hit you in the face, right? <laughs> There's this element that we can make government together and we can make democracy together. This is John Coltrane, one of my favorite jazz musicians, and you listen to one of his songs. He's one of the masters of improvisation. So that's the comparison between jazz music and American democracy. Now I'm going to pivot now, and we're going to talk about jazz music abroad, because this makes it more concrete. Jazz music abroad has a wonderful history. The, the second most famous person in the world in the 1950s was this man, Willis Conover. He was a DJ with the Voice of America radio. And he would come on at night and say, this is Willis Conover, and you're listening to the Voice of Jazz on Voice of America radio. And who was listening to him? Little towns in Soviet Russia, little hamlets in Nazi Germany, in the City of Light, Paris. And when he went to Soviet Russia, he was thronged by people. And the Soviets said, we have a problem. We're supposed to hate the Americans, but we love their music. We believe in communism, but this is Western decadent music. So they banned the music. It's like trying to ban hip-hop right now. You try to ban hip-hop, it's almost impossible. Try to ban airwaves, trying to ban iPods and iPads, it's impossible. So the music went the only place it could go, and that's underground. Nazi Germany, very similar. The Nazis, the Germans loved the music. But the Nazis said, you know what, this is a conspiracy. The Negroes and the Jews, Gershwin and Louis Armstrong, are coming together to take over our culture. So they killed some of the, some of the musicians. It's really tragic, really tragic chapter in American society and American uh, culture. And then you had France. France was the best place, even today. If you want to listen to some great jazz music, you can go to Tokyo. You can go to uh, 
uh, San Francisco, go to Paris. Josephine Baker, she was given a, she, she was an American uh, musician. She sang, she sang French. And what happened is the French would listen to the music, and this is Africans playing the music. The French colonized Africa. Jazz is actually French music. Jazz is French music. They started rewriting the lyrics into French. And Josephine Baker was given a 21-gun salute. It was Miles Davis who said, you know what? It wasn't until I went to Paris that I realized that not all white people were the same. A lot of African Americans, they went to Paris, they went to France, because they understood France was where democracy, where, where the freedom of rights, where liberty, where liberty was being wrought. The Declaration of Human Rights drafted in, in France. And here's the thing. With all these examples of jazz abroad, remember what was happening. Remember what was happening. You had a case of the American government, Dwight Eisenhower, asking Dizzy Gillespie, saying, please go to these countries and play our music. Win the hearts and minds of those in Nazi Germany. Win the hearts and minds of those in Soviet Russia. Long before Jackie Robinson integrated baseball, the first part of American civil society that was integrated was the jazz band. You had black musicians and white musicians playing together in the 1920s. You had America the Beautiful on the bandstand. America the Beautiful on the bandstand. It was an image of America the Beautiful, what could be and what can be. What could be and what can be. I think the jazz music is the virgin voice of America. It was Walt Whitman, the great American poet, who said, a country can be free, a country can have its own military, a country can have its own economy, but until it can have, until it can have its own native self-expression, until it can talk for itself, until it has its own culture, it's not truly free. He died a few years before jazz music was, was created. But I think he would, he would think that jazz music was the best of American music as it was the first American music. I was in Japan yesterday, and I wanted to see some Japanese art. So I was in Kyoto. I went to the Shogun Temple, and I saw the, the architecture. Ah, that's what, that was, what was going on in the Shogun Dynasty. All right. I went to, uh, I've been to the British Museum. You want to see what's happening in Egyptian art. You go see artwork, because art, art is the embodiment of values. Art is, is a fossil of what's happening in society. You want to know what's happening in Atlanta society? Go to the High Museum. See what was happening in Atlanta in the 1940s and 50s. Art is basically like a uh, time stamp, time box, time capsule. We can take it up, we can look at it and say, that's what we used to be. That's what we could become again. I think that this is very abstract, very sort of um, academic. So my question was, I found myself in New Orleans pre-Katrina, a few weeks before Katrina. I was writing this my book, and I got a, after Katrina happens, I get a phone call from some folks in the mayor's office. And he said, Kabir, we need you to look at the economy. I'm, I'm an investment banker working in an investment bank in New York uh, these days. And we need you to look at the economy because jazz music has a 300 to $400 million economic impact in the city of New Orleans. It's a big deal. And if, you've been, if you haven't been to New Orleans, you know that New Orleans is not New Orleans without, without the food and without the music, right? And they say about the New Orleans house party, there's two parts. When you go to a house party, there's the party in the living room and the party in the kitchen. And the one in the kitchen is always better, right? So I think we created, a, we, we created a way to bring musicians back to New Orleans. And I started to translate my thoughts and everything into a very simple idea, democratizing access of musicians all around America. So I created this organization with my friends, we're a nonprofit, but we never ask people for money. We don't need the money. Name your own price, book your own bands, create a job for a musician. We created hundreds of jobs around America. We, can, we create jobs in Atlanta. We democratize access to book music and bring the music that Walt women yearned for to all of our ears and into our houses. So I'll leave you with the, 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 the thought that jazz is democracy and sounds. It's beautiful music. If you're going to read The Great the Grace of Walt Whitman, 
and Louis Armstrong, excuse me, of Walt Whitman and Mark Twain. And, and we're, you know, every, every classroom, most classrooms, we study the greats. We study the greats. I ask you, please turn on your iPads and your iPhones and check this music out. It has a lot to teach us. The rest of the world fell in love with our music, and I think we can, love, we can fall in love with it all over again. Thank you very much. Thank you.